Things coming through okay? All right, great. Let's get started. Um, looks like the chat is uh, great here. Um, for all of those, for all of you that are in the chat, please feel free to ask questions in the chat uh, if anything comes up. And uh, I don't, I won't interrupt what I'm saying to answer them, uh, but I will take them at the end. Um, and uh, all right, let's get started. So. Um, Hi, uh, so today I'm here to talk about heating up analytical workloads with Apache Druid. Um, who am I? I am Gian Merlino. I'm a committer and PMC chair at Apache Druid. And I'm also co-founder at Imply, which is a company that is built upon Apache Druid and where we're spending uh, a lot of, uh, we're, we're doing a lot of investment into Apache Druid itself and doing a lot of contribution to upstream. And, we're um, really excited about open source and apply. So if you're interested in working on cool open source stuff, uh, like Apache Jura, then we're hiring and, and come talk to us afterwards. Um, so today, what are we gonna talk about? Uh, I'll talk about the data temperature spectrum. So this title of this talk is Heating Up Under the Workloads. I'll talk about what do I mean by heating things up? Um, and we're gonna meet Apache Jura and we're gonna then uh, see if we can apply a little bit of what we learned about how it works. Uh, to solving some problems. Okay, so first off, data temperature. Uh, what do I mean by that? So we sort of think of, in, in the Apache Druid world, um, we sort of think of data ranging on the spectrum from cold to hot. And uh, that's not to say anything bad about, thing, about, about cold data, cold's not bad, hot's not good, it's just different. And how are they different? Um, so at the top here, we have uh, our hot data representation, a beautiful bowl of uh, hot Cheetos and Takis and some nice cilantro and lime on that, very hot and fresh. Um, and hot and fresh is really what, what hot data is all about. So on the right-hand side, these are some typical requirements for hot data workloads. You typically want queries to be done in just a couple seconds. You typically want to be running on fresh data. Um, you may want to be able to be run even on real-time data as it comes in for observability purposes. You're really interested in high concurrency because you are going to have a lot of users on the platform. And you are doing highly interactive queries that we might call OLAP queries, online analytical queries. So slicing, dicing, looking at things from different angles. And the one, one really good example of a hot analytics application out in the wild is Google Analytics. So if you, if you use Google Analytics, you log into it, and you get to slice and dice through your data. You don't just see reports. You also can sort of explore things. And um, I think that the 10-second uh, elevator pitch for Apache Druid is if you were building Google Analytics and you wanted to, to, to find a good backend for it, Apache Druid would be a good backend for that. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, we have colder data. Uh, colder data, the requirements there, are slow queries are okay, less fresh data is okay. We're generally aiming for low concurrency, and our use cases are gonna be less interactive and more or oriented around reporting and planning. And um, you know, we might wonder, what's the point of this spectrum? Why have this whole thing? Why not make everything hot? Because hot just sounds better. Um, and the reason for that is generally gonna be cost-related. So these uh, colder workloads can be handled very cheaply by having compute that's sort of spun up when you need it and spun down when you don't need it. Um, it can also be handled cheaply by reading things off of uh, cold storage instead of having things, uh, instead of using caches, instead of using memory, instead of using local disk. And on the hot side, we're gonna focus more on situations where the querying system is always online. We're gonna be making heavy use of, we're gonna be eating the entire buffalo of the hardware. So we're gonna be, uh, leveraging memory, leveraging disk, leveraging uh, remote storage all to their maximum. Um, and, and that's kind of where the differences between these two kinds of ways of thinking about data come from. Uh, so it's here the visual, a visual representation of what um, a hot analytics application is all about. Uh, so this is implied pivot. This is the application that we built and imply to run on top of Druid. Um, and it's really applications like these that are why Druid exists in the first place. And, and the reason that I've used videos in this slide is because I think these kinds of applications are really shown at their best when they're moving. They're, they're meant to be interactive. You're meant to sort of drag and drop, 
click on things and have cross filtering. Um, and these kinds of, of quick drag and drop interactions are possible even on really huge amounts of data um, if you have a great system behind it. Um, the use cases for that, for why would you want this, uh, I think the two, the two interesting or two most interesting use cases for why you want this are exploration and monitoring. Um, exploration meaning, you know, I don't necessarily have a specific report that I want to generate. I'm just trying to understand what's going on in my data. Uh, maybe I saw some sort of anomaly and I want to understand the root cause of that anomaly. And, and this understanding of root causes of things is an exploratory process. Um, being able to drag and drop through things, being able to slice and dice through things, and having that sub-second to a couple second response time um, means the exploratory process is much more powerful. Um, and then monitoring, yeah, that's the other side of it. Monitoring is all about observability. It's about seeing what's happening right now. Uh, and on that, um, to enable monitoring, it's important to have real-time ingestion. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about architectures and where this all fits in. Uh, so um, in a typical data architecture, in a, in a big data or streaming architecture, you're gonna have some data sources. Um, you're going to have a data lake that's, that's pure storage. Um, you're going to have uh, some kind of data mover that gets data from your data sources in the data lake. Um, the data lake might be something like uh, HDFS or it might be one of the cloud services like um, S3 and AWS or other cloud vendors have similar offerings. Um, but at any rate, you'll have a, a data mover that gets data there. And some of those data movers, like Apache Kafka, um, are actually much, they go much, much beyond data movers. I think if, if the Apache Kafka folks heard me call them a data mover, they, they'd probably slap me. Um, because uh, that's not just a data mover, it's also something that is able to be the, the center of the streaming ecosystem. Um, but at any rate, uh, from my perspective, as a database person, I think of, it as a, I think of that ecosystem as data moving. Um, where you want to move data to is in the lake, um, and you can query data directly from the lake with the query engine. Uh, a lot of query engines these days work like that. Um, a good example is Hive, another good example is Presto. Uh, a lot of the modern cloud data warehouses, the way that they work under the hood is they're going to be querying data out of a cloud object store. So they are essentially acting as query engines top of data lakes. Um, and uh, you can also have a concept of a serving database. And a serving database is something that would store an optimized copy of your data uh, for serving purposes, for serving application. And for in this spot, people would use things like HBase, people would use things like Cassandra, um, and uh, today, Druid. Uh, so Druid is, is, we built Druid to be a serving layer for analytical applications. Um, and the history of Druid is really the history of, of people migrating to it for these kinds of applications uh, and uh, generally away from things that are either other things that we're seeing as serving layers, so like migrating an application from HBase to Druid is something that is, is pretty common, um, and uh, also migrating from things that you would consider from, as query engines, so migrating from like Hive or Presto to Druid for application serving. Um, and that's because it's, it's, it's something that's, like I was saying earlier, designed to occupy this area that, that's a sort of the hottest end of the spectrum. Um, but okay, how does it, what is Druid? How does it work? Um, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go through a little whirlwind tour of what Druid is, uh, and then spend some more time talking about how it works under the hood. Um, and I hope that you'll go away from this talk with an understanding of uh, what architectural properties exactly make Druid uh, something that, that occupies this part of the spectrum. Okay, so first off, what is Druid? Druid powers analytical applications. Um, like I mentioned, there's, there's Imply Pivot, that's the app that we built for Druid. There's a bunch of other analytical applications like Looker, Superset, Metabase, um, custom apps people build with SQL. Uh, Druid does speak SQL. Um, these uh, are, are third-party applications that uh, um, well, these are all third-party applications that, that are built on top of Druid. Um, Druid tends to be, uh, it's gotten some, some, I think, pretty exciting and pretty good adoption in some of the big tech companies. So it's used by Netflix, it's used by Mopub, which is a Twitter business unit, it's used uh, by Airbnb. And what these use cases all have in common is um, need for high performance at really big scale. 
So we're talking 100 plus billion rows per day of ingestion. We're talking trillions of rows retained. We're talking clusters of hundreds of servers and doing all this stuff while doing both streaming and batch ingestion and still achieving that sub-second to few seconds query latency. Um, the uh, benchmarks are always good. Um, one benchmark done somewhat recently last year was a, uh, a third-party benchmark done by some academic folks uh, of Drew versus Presto and Hive. Um, and the numbers come out looking pretty good. I would say I would categorize Presto and Hive as this core engine kind of system and Druid as a serving layer kind of system. Um, and uh, numbers, these double digit, triple digit numbers are um, exciting. And this is, this is why people start using Druid for these sorts of hot workloads. Um, at Imply, we also did some benchmarks with Druid versus uh, a couple of the leading cloud based data warehouses. I don't necessarily want to call them out by name, but. Um, Suffice to say that, that those things internally are also sort of query engine-like. Uh, they're also querying data lakes, and we see similar advantages in, in price performance for using Apache Druid versus using one of those things for these, these high analytic workloads and, and powering data applications. So OK, hopefully that, uh, hopefully that was a little bit of motivation to care about the next section, which is going to get technical pretty fast. Um, how does this work? How are we doing this stuff? How does Apache Druid work under the hood? Um, and, you know, like I said, hopefully this will inspire you to check out the technology a little bit more and may even inspire you to uh, contribute a little bit because, um, you know, we are at ApacheCon and uh, we're all about that here. Um, okay, so when we get to how it works, uh, I always like to start with this quote from Linus Torvalds, uh, one of the, um, well, and definitely a personality in our field. Uh, bad programmers worry about the code. Good programmers worry about data structures and their relationships. And I think this is a very interesting quote. Um, I don't necessarily love the value judgments about bad and good, but I think that the, that the point that he's trying to make is that data structures and the way they relate to each other is very is critical. Um, and it's critical to understanding what, what sets one system apart from another system, rather than, than specifics about how the code is written or how the code is organized. So, um, I'm going to take this to heart, and we're going to talk about how Apache Druid thinks about things from a data structure perspective and from a uh, data layout perspective. Um, so the first thing to understand about Apache Druid is that when you are making queries through it, it's a SQL system, like I was saying earlier. Um, when you make a SQL query through Apache Druid, you, uh, you send the query to the broker, which is um, a single server that's going to be the responsible for getting that query done. Um, it's not going to do most of the computation. Most of the computation will be done by data servers. And the data servers have these two components that run within them, um, historicals and indexers. Uh, indexers are responsible for loading new data. Historicals are responsible for serving queries on top of data that's already been loaded. Um, you can actually, you see there's an arrow here from the broker to the indexer. The broker can actually query data that's in the middle of being uh, loaded by an indexer, and that's how real-time uh, querying works in Druid. So typically, the most recent hour or so of data, if you're doing a streaming ingestion, will be served from the indexer, and then everything older than that from the historical. Um, the, in the historicals, uh, I'll, I'll focus mostly on the historicals for this next bit, because um, for most workloads, what we've seen is that the limiting factor for performance, um, and so what you need to care about the most is historical performance. Uh, and that's because there's a pretty small slice of data that's uh, coming in in real time. It's sort of on the indexers, and it's going to move to the historical soon. Um, but the vast majority of data, all your retention past about an hour or so is on the historicals. And so that, that's, uh, that's where most of your data is going to live. Um, in the historicals, there are data is broken down what we call segments. Um, uh, pictorially, I've represented them as these little yellow boxes with columns inside them, and that's um, not a coincidence. Uh, it's a columnar architecture under the hood. Um, each of these segments has uh, usually about a few million rows in it, um, and you can think of each segment as like a miniature database. Um, this is a concept that is used by a lot of other analytical data systems uh, to have these sort of chunked up columnar um, segment files, data files. Uh, you can think of individual ORC and Parquet files in a data lake as something like this. Uh, I, I think in, in BigQuery, there's a tablet concept that's like this. Um, it's a pretty universal concept. 
Um, in Druid, uh, each of these segments is partitioned by time. Um, and in this example here, I've got a, a, a sort of a pre-COVID example of um, ticket sales being made for various artists in various cities. Uh, and um, what we're going to do first is we're going to split up the data by time. Um, we might also do a secondary partition if your data is really big by some other dimension, but we'll always partition by time first. And the reason we're doing that is to enable a global time index. So um, this is leveraging the fact that for the kinds of applications people typically build on Druid, it's really common to have a time filter on most of your queries. Um, and having a global time index uh, means that we can really quickly narrow down to the, the time ranges that relate to a particular query. Um, so that means each segment in this particular example is going to cover an hour of data. Um, and again, if you have more data in that hour than one segment can hold, if you have more than a few million rows per hour, then we're just going to do a secondary positioning and split it into multiple segments, each about a few million rows. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about what happens inside a segment. So inside a segment, the uh, query engine data format are really tightly integrated. And this is where the data structure stuff comes in. So there's four things I'm going to talk about. And on the next few slides, I'll go through an example query. And I'll trace through how that query runs on a specific segment. Um, and, and hopefully, that will help illustrate uh, both how we store data in Druid and how computations on the data actually work. So um, the first thing I'll be talking about, uh, or one thing I'll be talking about, is compression. Um, we compress every, uh, we compress all your data by first click into columns and then compress each column with something specific to the type of data that's in that column. Um, this is a, a pretty common column or storage technique. Uh, I'll talk about our secondary indexes. So we have bitmap indexes for all of your string columns, um, unless you have turned them off for that particular column. Um, I'll talk a bit about how we operate on compressed data. So one example of that is, well, we dictionary code uh, all of the string columns, and we'll operate on these dictionary codes instead of the strings whenever we can. Um, that's one example. There's a few others. And then I'll, I'll, we'll talk about latent materialization, which is just a, a fancy database person term for um, not reading things that you don't need to read until you have to. OK, so let's, let's first let's look at a segment. Um, this is what a segment looks like. Uh, this is that same status scheme we were talking about earlier. So there's a timestamp, there's an artist, there's city, price, and count. This is a ticket sales data set. Um, this particular segment has eight rows in it. Uh, I know I said they usually have a few million, um, but the font size would be too small if we tried to put them all here. So this one has eight. Um, the order of the columns here, uh, in a sense, doesn't matter because uh, they're all stored separately in the segment. But in a sense, it does matter because we store the columns in the same order that they're sorted in. And the sorting matters for reasons we'll talk about later, uh, maybe a bit later. But for now, uh, let's not worry too much about the order the columns are stored in. Um, the order of the rows is very important because it's all correlated. So the first value in the time column matches the first value in the price column, which matches the first value in the count column. You take the first value from every column, and that, that equals a row. Um, OK, so in terms of compression, we're going like I mentioned, we're going to compress each one differently. The first column, the time column, um, because all in this example, the timestamps are all the same. In a real example, um, they wouldn't be necessarily the same, but they would be uh, all in a pretty small range. Because this segment, remember, is storing about an hour's worth of data, so they'd all be within an hour of each other. So what we'll do there is we'll do some sort of um, encoding where we store the base value. And then every row, we don't actually store the full timestamp. We store a bit-packed uh, representation of the difference between that row and the base value. Um, this reduces the amount of bits we have to store per row and is a, is a form of how we compress the long columns. And then on top of that, we'll do LZ4. Um, we'll do similar things for the data section of the string columns. Um, the index, uh, we compress that using one of two algorithms, either concise uh, bitmap compression or roaring bitmap compression. Um, roaring is the default now as of a couple of releases ago. Uh, we do support both. Um, and the dictionary is itself a form of compression, like I was mentioning. We don't have to actually store each individual uh, artist's name. We can just store in the data section. We can just store each name one time uh, and then store the dictionary code in the data section. Um, 
And uh, okay, so this is this is how we store a segment. Um, let's look at the sample query. So this query uh, is selecting the city and the total price um, for a particular artist grouping by city. So it's just saying for this particular artist, Justin, um, what are all the cities that uh, experienced ticket sales for this artist, and what was the total price of tickets in that city? So a pretty simple query. Um, and let's go through how we are going to compute this. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to resolve the where filter. Um, and um, we are going to do that by first looking at the dictionary. Uh, and one important thing with the dictionary is that it stores sorted in lexicographic order. And that's important because it means that we can do binary searches through the dictionary to find things. We don't actually have to do a linear scan. Um, so we don't have to read every value in the dictionary just to find a single value. So here we will probably read two of them. Um, we'll probably read catch first and see that's not it. And then notice that we have to go up with the binary search. We'll read Justin and then we'll, we'll get Justin as zero. Um, so now we know that uh, dictionary code zero, dictionary ID zero for artist is the one that we're looking for. Um, next we're going to the index. So we have the index is stored in the same order as the dictionary. So we just do a random access into the index to pick out the um, index values for um, the first entry. Uh, and um, this is one of those areas where it's useful to us that we are going to be able to sort of, you know, like I was saying, um, use the whole the uh, the whole server. Um, so these indexes are generally used sort of memory. Um, as opposed to being read off disk or read off the network or something like that. Um, so we, uh, um, but not the, the entire segment, by the way, is not stored in memory. Uh, the data sections are, um, the data sections may be paged in and out. Okay, so we're going to read the index. We're going to see that the index uh, is a bitmap um, with bits 0, 1, and 2 set. Um, and that means that the first three rows, row 0, 1, and 2, are the rows that have uh, the value Justin. So OK, so now we know which rows have that value. And so the where clause has been, um, the where clause has been resolved. And uh, one interesting thing, or one important thing, is that we didn't actually have to look at the data section at all for the artist column. Even though the filter is on artist, we only looked at the index and the dictionary. Um, and this is that, that concept of being really economical about what you read. Um, okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we are going to go to the city column and the price column. We're going to look at the first three rows, the, the ones that match our filter, um, and we're going to aggregate them. We're going to do the group by and the summing uh, in the next stage. Um, because we know there's only three possible cities and three is a small number, we're going to allocate an array for this. Um, if uh, there was a larger number of cities or if we didn't know the number of cities, um, then uh, instead of an array, we'd use a hash table. So we use either an array or a hash table. Um, believe it or not, uh, this is actually a really important optimization because um, when you get into the weeds of what uh, databases like Druid spend their time on, um, computing hash codes and doing hash table manipulations uh, is actually a pretty big chunk of it. And so using an array is, is, a, is a big win uh, when possible. Um, so in this case, we are going to use an array. Uh, we're going to read the first three columns. Row one and or we're going to see that that um, one has one value, twenty nine and twelve. Um, two has two values, eighteen hundred and nineteen fifty three. And they add them together and get thirty seven fifty three. Uh, zero didn't have any values, so it's null. And then we're done. We read the first three um, entries from the city. We read the first three entries from the price, um, and we have computed a uh, aggregation. Next, we go to the dictionary, and we replace those two dictionary IDs, 1 and 2, um, with LA and SF. We don't replace 0, because there's no reason to, because uh, nothing was aggregated for 0, so we ignore that one. Um, at this point, we have the result. We have uh, the result for this segment is there's, there's 2912 for LA, 3753 for SF. And to get the result, we did not have to read that much. We had to read. Um, a couple entries from the dictionary, because we were doing a binary search. We had to read one entry from the index for one column. Um, we had to read two entries from the dictionary for another column. And then we had to read three rows from the data section of city and price. 
Um, and so this is this is pretty uh, minimal in terms of uh, what you could the, the lowest you could possibly read for this query without pre-computing some of the results. Um, and that's that's really the key to performance. Uh, the key to performance is um, not doing things uh, and organizing your data in a way that enables you to not do things. Um, Okay, so the final thing I want to talk about is sort of practical applications of uh, some of what we've learned, um, or implications of it, and how to think like um, how to think like a database person when you are modeling your data and when you're using the database. Um, so I want to talk about the power of data layout. So uh, in the previous slides, we had this sort of schematic, um, this uh, a schematic version of what a, a column looks like. There's a data section, dictionary section, and map section. Um, let's consider a, uh, a column that's a bit longer. Instead of eight rows, let's consider only 16 rows. Um, and uh, one thing that I mentioned in passing in the previous slides uh, is that we're also going to LZ4 compress these data sections on top of our regular bit packing. And that's because it turns out that when you apply those two together, um, they, they tend to stack top of each other pretty well. So we're going to LZ4 compress each of these chunks. Um, LZ4 is a compression algorithm that requires decompressing an entire chunk at a time. So if we split this row uh, or this segment up into four row chunks and compress each four row chunk separately, um, what that means is that uh, in order to read a single row out of a chunk, we have to actually read the entire chunk, decompress the entire chunk with LZ4, and then we can do a random access into that chunk to get the bits, and then we can decode the bits. Um, and this is, uh, this, we only need to read the chunks that have um, data that we need to read, but uh, we want to avoid situations where we're reading very small amounts out of a large number of chunks. Um, so one way to do that is that if you are often, um, if you're often filtering by something, that is uh, very selective. Um, so let's say there's a, there's a column that you often filter on, and that column is, is very selective in the sense that filters on the column tend to narrow down your data set to a very small percentage, down to 1% or half percent or 2% of the overall data set. Um, it really is a good idea to also sort by that column, um, partition and sort by that column. And sorting by that column means that we minimize the number of blocks to read when filtering on that column. Um, because all the blocks for the same filter, all the, all the rows with the same filter value are likely to be together in the same few blocks. And so here, let's say that's artists. Let's say that we actually have three artists. Maybe we have you know, thousands of artists. We're always filtering by artists. Um, and each one has a small slice of the overall data set. So we might sort on that. And here, instead of um, each one being all spread out, uh, no artist is in more than two chunks. Um, and because each artist is in no more than two chunks, if we're filtering on a single artist, we never have to read more than two chunks to satisfy a query, as opposed to potentially having to read all four chunks. Uh, in the, for example, in the, in the middle thing, you can see that, that Kesha number one um, does a one in every chunk, and so we would have to decompress every chunk in order to read those rows. So this is good. This is, uh, this is good. Um, and uh, how do we actually do it? Um, well, uh, the way that you do it in Druid is you put the thing you want to sort by first in the dimensions list. Um, rows are sorted first by time, and then are sorted by dimensions in the order that you provide them in the dimension spec. If you haven't used Druid before and this doesn't look familiar to you, don't worry about it. Um, it's part of the uh, definition for how to load data into Druid, which is written in it's, uh, JSON's specification for um, a data loader. Um, so whatever is first here is going to be immediately after time in the sort order. Um, there's also a little trick that uh, I always love these little tricks. Um, there's a little trick that at some point I think will be unnecessary because I think it's likely we'll want to make this a first class feature. Uh, but right now it's a trick uh, as of the latest version, 019. Um, and this is what if you want to put time after artists? What if you want to sort by artists first and then time as opposed to sorting by time first? You know, what I was saying earlier is that we implicitly always sort by time first. Um, well, the way to do that is you can make a secondary timestamp column uh, that has the timestamp that uh, comes to your original data. Um, and then make the primary timestamp column um, the same granularity as your partitioning. So let's say you're partitioning by day. That means every segment has one day of data. Uh, partition by day and make the primary timestamp just the day. 
all those values are the same. Because they're all the same, even though technically we're sorting by at first, it's not going to affect the sort order because they're all the same anyway. Um, and then the secondary timestamp column will have uh, what you would call the real timestamp in it. Um, and that can be put anywhere you want in sort order. So this is sort of a fun little trick um, that, uh, you know, it, it, like I was saying, I prefer to not be a trick. I prefer it to be a first class feature, but for now it's a trick. Um, I just wanted to show the impact of doing stuff like this on uh, the potential impact of doing stuff like this on um, data layout and on performance. So here's a real world example of a flame graph, uh, which is an awesome tool for um, measuring performance and understanding performance. Uh, here's a real world flame graph um, showing uh, what performance is like on a query of a particular data set that had these features I mentioned. It did have a, uh, these queries were all filtering on a certain column. That column uh, was such that every filter would hit about one or two percent of the data, and it was all jumbled up. Um, it was all jumbled up such that a lot of queries had to read a lot of chunks and then decode uh, small numbers of rows from those chunks. Um, and here's what you get. What you get is look at all this LZ4 decompression. Um, all these arrows point to um, time being spent just decompressing LZ4. Uh, we're spending so much time doing this. Uh, in this case, in this real, real world example, what we did was we uh, did both of those things. We changed the sort order to put that column first, and we did the secondary timestamp trick. Um, and uh, the same queries, um, eight times faster, uh, eight times lower CPU time. Um, and the overall profile looks a lot nicer. It looks a lot more well behaved. Instead of LZ4 decompression being 90 plus percent of the time, it's now, you know, it's, it's there's still we're still doing a lot of it, but that makes sense because we need to do it to do the query. It's it's um, but it's not it's not everything we're doing. We're seeing we're seeing actual visible amounts of time being spent in other parts of the query stack, and the overall CPU time per query is eight times less. Um, so I hope that this uh, I hope that in this talk you got a little bit of a flavor of um, what is the purpose of uh, thinking about data on a temperature spectrum. Um, why we, in the Apache Druid world, think that, that Druid is a good solution on the hot side of that spectrum when you really do want to use everything. You want to use memory, disk, and, and uh, deep storage, and all the stuff to the fullest. Um, and how thinking about the way that databases lay out data and how they process it, uh, thinking about that and then um, using those thoughts to control how they do it can actually make really huge differences in the performance you get out of databases. Uh, like Druid and others. This, these sorts of tricks work on any sort of column database. Um, OK, I think uh, that's, that's the last slide I had. So um, thank you all for coming. Stay in touch. Follow us on Twitter. We have a Twitter at Druid.io. Um, uh, please join the community if you're interested in chatting more about Druid. It's at druid.apache.org. Um, we're on ASF Slack. We do uh, meetups, which are all virtual now. One day, they'll stop being virtual again. Um, and of course, like I mentioned earlier, we're hiring for uh, working under a data and if you're interested in um, that kind of thing. Uh, thank you. Let's see, Q&A. Um, do we have anything in the chat? Let's see if I, but um, no, it's more minutes, so I'll hang out for two more minutes, and then uh, I'm going to go check out some of the other sessions. Uh, do I have a link to the benchmark between Druid and Presto and Hive? Um, I think if you search for it, you'll find it. Why don't I search for it and see if I can find it? Um, yeah, here it is. Uh, what was the tool used for profiling and time spent decompression? Yeah, great question. Um, uh, that was Swiss Java Knife. Uh, and um, here's a link uh, that both has a, uh, a knowledge base article at our site that has a link on how to download it and also some instructions on how to use it. It's a really cool tool, um, one of my favorite tools.
All right, well, thank you all for coming. Um, and I'm going to go take a break and then head check out some other sessions. And uh, have a good time at ApacheCon, everybody.